Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast, brought to you by Workman Forensics. Joining me today is Matt Davis. Matt is a career investigator who has handled all types of investigations, from charges of DUI to homicide, as well as numerous civil actions of personal injury on behalf of the plaintiff. He began his career in investigations as a death investigator for the Oklahoma Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Now he performs case analyses for attorneys in Oklahoma and is employed with Oklahoma Indigent Defense System. Matt has developed and currently teaches an eight-hour training course on the basics of conducting a death investigation. Matt is an avid Chicago Cubs fan, a media mediocre golfer, his words, not mine, and enjoys spending time with his wife, two kids, and a Labradoodle. Thanks for joining me today, oh, yeah. Matt. Hey, thanks, Leah. I appreciate being here. As the listeners probably heard in your bio, you have a very unique investigative background. So would you tell us about your path to get where you are today? Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, so I, uh, I started my investigations career as a uh, medical legal death investigator with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Um, I worked about 400 scene investigations for the ME's office and then later obtained my private investigator's license. And uh, from there, I started contracting with families and attorneys in both Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And then uh, started around late 2015, I was offered a full-time position with a law firm in Norman. Uh, That firm mostly handled family and domestic casework, but they also took on some criminal defense work, uh, which gave me an opportunity to really figure out you know, some civil procedure and criminal procedure and get a better understanding of the legal system and how investigations kind of works into that. Uh, After a while, one of the partners of that firm left and went to a larger firm in Oklahoma City. And the the owner of that firm reached out to me, asked me if I wanted to come on board. And and, and that firm handled a lot of personal injury work, plaintiff's personal injury work, uh, dealing with large trucking accidents, and then a a lot of DUI casework. And, and some other criminal defense work. So I took them up on that offer. And then in February of 2018 is when I got offered a full-time position with the indigent defense system doing strictly criminal defense casework. Uh, took that one. It's been three years ago and haven't really looked back since. So uh, kind of got to this point by, you know, getting to work with a lot of different lawyers, really talented lawyers in a lot of different areas between civil and criminal law. Uh, so it's, it's, I've been pretty, uh, pretty lucky. You got a lot of, a lot of good experience from attorneys and also a lot of training along the way. Did you want to be an investigator? Is that what you went to school uh, for? My degree is in criminal justice and I've got a minor in Homeland Security. Uh, prior to getting that degree, I, I was actually an EMT. I was a nationally registered EMT. So I had this kind of this background of, you know, understanding of medical terminology and some anatomy, but then I had a, a formal education in criminal justice and so, especially when that position with the medical examiner's office came up, you know, it really seemed like that was a, a really good, uh, good fit for somebody with my background at the time. Yeah, for sure. I've never had anyone on the show who is a death or has experience being a death scene investigator or even a DUI uh, case analyst or a defense investigator in general, like criminal defense investigator. So we have a lot to talk about today because I have questions about all of these. I'd like to start with death scene investigations. If you'd kind of give us, I mean, gosh, I've, you know, I've done a lot of different kinds of investigations, but they've always had something to do with money or business. Uh, when I was at the bureau, I kind of helped on some, I don't know, anything that involved a lot of paper, which could include like kind of joint terrorism task force type stuff. But this is really new to me. So I've got a lot of questions. So first of all, what does a death scene investigation look like? Like what would your role have been in a death scene? Investigation? Okay. So when I, when I work for the medical examiner's office, the, w- the way this is set up is, uh, you know, if somebody is found deceased uh, by a family member, by a friend, uh, whomever, their first thing they're going to do is they're going to call 911 and police are going to show up. Police are going to look at that scene and they're going to say, "Okay, do we think there's any type of foul play? Do we think there's any type of trauma to this body? If so, they're going to call the medical examiner's office and the medical examiner's office employs investigators. These investigators will fill those calls. They'll determine if it falls under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner. So that's typically anything that's violent, unusual, unnatural, or suspicious. Uh, If it falls within the jurisdiction of the medical examiner's office, and when I say jurisdiction, I mean the medical examiner's office has exclusive jurisdiction over the body and anything immediately around the body. So if this death appears to be something that would fall under the medical examiner's office's jurisdiction, then an investigator is going to assume jurisdiction and they'll go to that scene. 
Once the investigator goes to the scene, the ME's office is charged with conducting an independent investigation to determine the cause and the manner of death. So they're not looking for any criminal intent. They're not looking for a criminal action. They're, they're trying to determine the cause and the manner of death. As, so that investigator will go to the scene. They'll do their own scene investigation, take their own photographs, walk through that scene, document any evidence, collect any evidence that's on or around the body. They'll document any injuries to that body. And, and then they'll arrange for the body to be sent to the medical examiner's office for an autopsy. And then the investigator will then start talking to witnesses at the scene, talking to law enforcement at the scene to try and get as much information information around when was this body found, who last saw this person alive, you know, what drives this individual, what kind of, uh, you know, social history do they have, drug use history, uh, and find everything out that they can about this person and what led up to their death. Okay, so then after you would find out this information, does that then what do you do with that? You take all the information that you have, all your photographs, uh, all of your interviews, and you put everything down into a report. And then you'll take those reports and you'll present them to the forensic pathologist. So let's say you're on call one night at the ME's office. The next morning, you're going to have all of your reports prepared and you're going to have a briefing with the forensic pathologists that are on duty that day. You're going to bring up a caseload. You're going to talk about the cases, what you discovered, who you talked to, And then those cases will be divided up between those doctors. They'll bring those bodies out in the morgue and they'll start their autopsies. So then the pathologist is using the scene information gathered by the investigator, as well as observations they make at autopsy to make a final determination as to cause and manner of death. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Providing some context for what they're going to see with the body. Okay. This is, this is making sense to me. Uh, well, so- and you bring up, you know, providing context and, and it's important that, that you bring that up because let's say you have, let's say you have a person that has a gunshot wound to the head. Okay. Well, the cause of death is pretty apparent. It's a gunshot wound to the head, but was this a suicide? Was this a homicide? Was this, you know, an accidental discharge? So you can have three different manners of death with the same cause of death. But you can only determine that manner of death if you have a good scene investigation and get information from that scene. Yeah, yeah, that, I can see how that would be really helpful. I, I mean, important, not just helpful, but important. So are there certain things that when you were doing death scene investigations that like you always looked for or kind of, you know, I, I guess what I'm asking with this question is the more fraud investigations I do, there's just certain things that like, okay, I always want to look at these three things, you know, or whatever that might be. Did you notice those types of things having done, you know, four, I think you said 400. Yeah, I I was, I was just short of 400 scene investigations after I was finished with the medical examiner's office. Yeah. So is there something that like sticks out in your mind that these are the things that we were all, that I was always. Well, um, I mean, no, no two death scenes are ever the same. Uh, Just like probably no two fraud cases are really ever the same. Uh, But the main thing that we're looking for is consistency. We want to see that there's consistency with the evidence found on the body, the injuries found on the body, evidence recovered at the scene, and statements from witnesses. If there's inconsistencies, then we need to start looking into those. So obviously, the biggest thing we're always looking for is, is everything consistent? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Hopefully, a future hire of mine isn't listening to this before they answer questions. But before I hire someone, one of the one of the questions that they get asked is, "How do you know in a like data analysis? How do you know that you are done? You know, like sometimes it just seems like there could continue to be all these rabbit trails. And so one of the answers that I'm always looking for is, "Well, we've looked at this from you know this many different ways." And it seems like I keep getting the same answer. And so that would be really similar, I think, to what you're saying. We're we're looking for consistent that's the consistency tells us that we're kind of okay, we're done looking at this piece. But in yours, you're looking for that to to help with that providing the best it, it sounds like the best evidence to the medical. Right. Team. You know, like it's so for example, if we have uh, using this gunshot wound to the head scenario, if we if we've got a person that you know, witnesses are saying, let's say witnesses are saying, oh, you know, I, I saw them, they, they put that gun to their head and they shot themselves. Okay, well, then we would expect that to be consistent with, say, a, a contact gunshot wound or a, a loose contact gunshot wound. But let's say we look at this body and we see, say, uh, powder tattooing 
around the, the gunshot wound? Well, we know that powder tattooing is a hallmark of an intermediate range gunshot wound, which is gonna take place, say, between one and three feet away. And now we've got some inconsistencies. But if they say, oh, I saw them put that to their head and, and then they did that, and then we see you know, a muzzle imprint, we see a, a good abrasion ring, we don't see that powder tattooing, then we've got some consistencies. So we're always looking for consistency between statements and what we're finding on the body and at the scene. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So do you perform any of these types of investigations now that you're not with the medical examiner office, but just as a consulting? Well, PI? I, so even at my work at, at the indigent defense system, I, uh, I, I would say that, yeah, I, I do, I do death investigation, but it's not say the, the same way that the medical examiner's office does it. Obviously, you know, by the time I get into a case, a, a body's gone, it's already been buried or cremated. So we don't have that body to look at, but we have the photographs, we have the witnesses. Um, and so essentially what I'm doing is uh, really it's, it would be like an equivocal death investigation. So let's say there are unanswered questions. Uh, and, and when I say unanswered questions, that can mean, you know, if I'm hired privately by a family, they might disagree with the official ruling. Let's say it was ruled a suicide and the family thinks, no, you know, my, my loved one wouldn't do that. I think this was an accident or, or I think this was a homicide. Then essentially I'm looking, I'm, I'm going to compare the, the ruling of the medical examiner and, and the investigation that they did. And I'm going to do my own investigation and I'm going to see, do I come up with that same information? Do I find this same evidence that was found during the Emmy's investigators work? Or do I find new information? And then I'm going to start comparing that information. Same as with the indigent defense system. If it's a murder case, okay, we have a body and the state has their theory. The state's theory is that this was a homicide and that that defendant is the one who did it. Okay, so now I'm going to do my own investigation. And if and I'm going to either see, do I come up with the same conclusion that they're coming up with, or am I coming up with a different conclusion? Uh, so yes, I do death investigation. It's just a lot, I would say it's a lot cleaner now. Um. So whenever you have done these investigations, like as a consultant, so the equivocal uh, death, is that what you called it? Equivocal death? Yeah, equivocal? yeah I, I call it equivocal death just because, you know, where there's essentially questions remaining. Um, now, it might not be equivocal, say, to the district attorney's office or to law enforcement or to the medical examiner. But if the family believes that there's something missing, they have unanswered questions or this, they still think this is questionable, then I'm terming that an equivocal death. And so I'm basically going to do a comparison of the official ruling versus the family's belief or in, say, a criminal defense case the official ruling versus the defense theory. Okay. Yeah, I understand. So in these types of cases, in doing this for, you know, tr helping these clients, have you ever had a case that what law enforcement found or what they had determined that you found evidence that would reverse that decision? Um, actually, I had one. Uh, it was one of the first murder cases I was assigned when I got to the indigent defense system. I found a lot of information um, through medical examiner documents. And uh, I mean, we can go into that case uh, now or later um, if we want to talk about the indigent, indigent defense system later. But um, ultimately, it resulted in a not guilty verdict at trial. It was, a, it was probably one of my favorite cases I've ever worked. OK, let's go ahead and let's talk about the Oklahoma indigent defense system, because I didn't know that this existed at all before I had talked to you. And so I'd like to learn a little bit more about that and the types of criminal defense cases that you work for the state agency. And then, yeah, then we definitely need to talk about this case. So would you tell us about what you're doing now, what types of criminal ca defense cases that you're working for? Yeah, um, yeah the, uh, the Oklahoma Indigent Defense System. So it's a state agency. It was created by statute uh, around the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. It was originally started, I believe, out of the OU Law Clinic, and then it became a state agency. So the, the purpose of the agency is to provide legal representation to criminal defendants who, who don't have the financial resources to hire private counsel. And then also the agency employs investigators uh, because there's Supreme Court law that says uh, criminal defendants are entitled to, the, to expert services at, at public expense. So we handle cr solely criminal defense work across the state, except for Tulsa and Oklahoma counties. And, and that's only at the trial level. And we also handle casework at the appellate level in, in all, uh, all 77 counties in the state. 
Um, as far as the type of cases that I primarily handle there, I think I've got about 28 open cases on my caseload right now, and probably 14 or 15 of them are either first or second degree murder or first degree manslaughter. I use, those are typically the cases I get. Um, it's a, we've got a pretty good structure at the agency. So within investigations, you know, we have kind of different, different investigators with different niches, you know, like mine is mostly in kind of the, the blood and guts and, and, and the nasty stuff. We've also got a guy who, um, you know, he's, he's, he was formerly an investigative journalist, uh, extremely intelligent guy. Uh, he handles things that are, you know, pretty heavy on witness interviews because he's exceptional at interviewing, uh, interviewing witnesses. Uh, we've got a gal who uh, spent about 25, 30 years in the mental health field as a licensed counselor, uh, mental health counselor, forensic counselor. So she handles a lot of cases involving, you know, the, the possibility that there might be some mental health problem. And then you have a string of extremely talented attorneys as well that, that work across the state. So that leads me to kind of another question related to experts and the fact that, you know, these cases are entitled to have expert representation. Do you guys ever work with, like, let's say that there was a fraud case or some sort of white collar case that's going to be prosecuted at the state level. Do you guys ever work with volunteers who will volunteer as experts on these cases? Well, um, we we work with experts routinely, and they're actually not even on a volunteer basis. We we have an expert database, so all of our all of our experts that are brought onto a case are they're paid. Um, they're vendors. They're they're set up as as a vendor for the state of Oklahoma. Uh, you know, we have, we contract rates with these uh, experts and I mean, they range anywhere from, you know, sane nurses up to private forensic pathologists to um, PhDs in biomechanics and, and everything in between. So yeah, I mean, we, we work with all different types of experts. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm just kind of, uh, you know, we have listeners who are looking to do more investigative work or more expert work. And so sometimes they can feel like, where in the world can I get this experience? And so one of the things that we do here in Tulsa is that we've like our firm volunteers with the Tulsa Police Department and their financial crimes unit. So that's what I was kind of thinking of. Like this is, again, another state agency, you know, that there might be opportunities for somebody to get experience in, you know, or expanding their experience or something. So so in these cases that you work when you're the investigator, do you testify yeah, I have been called to testify in cases. Um, I actually, I didn't do anything all of last year because of coronavirus. Everything was basically shut down and all jury trials were getting continued. So the last time, uh, the last time I testified, it was November of 2019. Uh, but I do get called to testify. Uh, you know, if there's a case that I'm working that I've got some particular expertise in, and the attorney wants me to get up there. If I go out to a scene and take my own photographs, or if we go examine evidence, and I'm taking my own photographs of the evidence, and we want to get those pictures in at trial, well, of course, I'm going to need to get up there and, and sponsor those photographs so that we can get them admitted. So I, I do routinely get asked to go to, a, to trial and testify. So now we have to jump into this case. If you'll just start sharing the story, and if I have a question, I'll jump in and kind of interrupt you. But I'd love to just know more about this story so that we can see exactly kind of how all of this works together. We'll be right back to this interview. At Workman Forensics, we're your modern day Sherlock Holmes. The team at Workman Forensics follows patterns to find money through forensic accounting and fraud investigation services. Using our data sleuth process, we build client cases telling the story of what actually happened. This process serves clients in the best way, whether they are going through a divorce, a partnership dispute, an estate and trust dispute, or a fraud investigation. So what is data sleuthing? Well, after serving clients in this best way for 10 years, we are proud of our technological improvements, making our investigations work similar to that of a manufacturing process. By following a consistent investigative and internal process, our team addresses client concerns in a timely, responsive, and thorough manner. But don't worry, clients don't go through this process alone. We believe communication is vital to the success of an engagement. So each client is guided by a highly trained and specialized expert forensic accountant along the way. And because we think data sleuthing is the best way to investigate financial disputes, we work to train other professionals as well through our investigation games, guided interactive workshops, and our Be A Data Sleuth seminars. To learn more about any of these services or trainings, visit our website, workmanforensics.com. 
In fact, our website is full of resources for anyone looking to learn more about forensic accounting, fraud investigation, or our data sleuth process. This includes blog posts, free Excel downloads, more podcast episodes, and links to our YouTube channel. So if you're looking to get into the investigation industry, or if you've been an investigator for years, we know you'll find something helpful in our free resources. So visit our website, workmanforensics.com. Welcome back to the podcast. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this was one of the first murder cases that I was assigned when I came in, in 2018. Uh, the death originally occurred, I believe it was in 2015. So a woman, she was, she died in the room at her home. Her husband was there. Uh, the body was taken to the medical examiner's office because they noticed what looked like some bruising around her neck. She was uh, taken to the medical examiner's office. They did a, they did an autopsy on her and her cause of death was ruled as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with blunt force trauma to the head and neck. Now, blunt force trauma can be anything from a bruise to a broken bone to, you know, a, in any type of blunt injury, lacerations, abrasions, but she had some blunt trauma to her head and neck. And what that blunt trauma was, was she had a small bruise on the right side of her head. And there was no skull fracture. There was, uh, it was just a small bruise. And then she had this somewhat patterned injury on the left side of her neck. And she also had a fractured hyoid bone, which sits up in the neck, kind of up, up high up under the jaw. Uh, fractured hyoid bones can be, you know, a, a sign of strangulation but they, they also are not. They can, they can be broken other ways. Uh, she had a really lengthy medical history, um, a, lot, a lot of health problems, including you know, failure to thrive and myotonic muscular dystrophy. But anyways, the body was taken up there and it was examined and they ruled the cause of death as COPD with this blunt force trauma to the head and neck, but the manner of death was ruled undetermined. And when they rule it undetermined, it means that they don't have sufficient information to rule it any other way, such as homicide or accident or natural or suicide. So the pathologist ruled it undetermined and it went and it stayed that way for two years. And then in 2017, uh, the manner of death was changed to homicide and her husband was arrested and charged with first degree murder. So I get brought onto this case. I'm looking at everything that the attorney has. And there are a number of documents that the medical examiner's office does not routinely turn over because they don't consider them part of their official case file. And, and I know of what these documents are. So I tell the attorney, go ahead and make a request through the DA's office and get these other documents. Because the, the state's theory was that this woman's husband had strangled her to death. And uh, we get these additional documents and I look through it and there are some, some case consultation notes where this OSBI agent had gone to the medical examiner's office and talked with the pathologist that did the autopsy. Uh, the agent had made a room documentation video where this woman's husband showed him everything that happened, where he found her and, and, you know, and what took place and what he recalled. So the pathologist reviews this video and then shows the uh, the agent a an article out of a medical research journal. So I want to find out what this article is. And we go up. So I go up to the Emmy's office. I sit down with the pathologist and interview her. And I find out that the article that she showed this agent was titled "Highway Bone Fractures from Agonal Falls: Not Always a Sign of Strangulation." So it seemed it appeared to me that after reviewing this room documentation video that this OSBI agent provided her, she thought, okay, well, you know, I think this person, this woman suffered a fall and struck a protruding object, which is what caused that blunt force injury. I think it was probably exacerbation of her COPD. And then she fell and struck an object, but it didn't seem that the OSBI agent was pleased with that because that was early on in the case. That was still in 2015 when, when this all took place. So we jump forward to 2017, two years later, the same agent goes back to the Emmy's office, only this time he doesn't talk to the pathologist that performed the autopsy. He goes straight to the chief. And then it was shortly after talking to the chief. And the only consultation note from that visit, all it said was 30 minutes. So I just know that this agent sat down with the chief medical examiner for 30 minutes. And it was shortly after that, that the manor was changed to homicide and her husband was arrested. And keep in mind, this was her husband of 27 years and they had no history of domestic violence, not even a single phone call to the police saying my husband yelled at me. 
nothing. And now he's charged with first degree murder. So we take it to trial. We present all of our evidence. And, uh, and, and the scariest part of this was at the trial, the, the medical examiner who did the autopsy even testified in court that she has had cases in the past where she ruled the cause of death asphyxiation due to manual strangulation and the manner of death homicide when she had no medical findings at autopsy to support it. But the reason she made that ruling was because law enforcement told her that somebody confessed to doing it that way. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's frightening. And, oh my gosh. and so the jury, the jury deliberated for two hours and they came back two hours later with a not guilty verdict. It was I mean, it was one of these cases had they not had these additional documents to see these interactions between the OSBI and the medical examiner's office and what was discussed in those meetings and then follow up on those on those notes to figure out what was this article that you showed this agent? Because all it said was discussed, reviewed case and showed article. So had it not been for following up on that and finding out what was this article that you actually showed him? Okay. I'm like kind of processing that for a second. So (laughs) I I want to be, you know, I want to be respectful to everyone's like career, like law enforcement, so appreciative. And, but then also, you know, there's this counter balance uh, with criminal defense and the rights that, you know, due process and all of those things. And so I guess one of my questions is what's the incentive or are there incentives for, like, an, like in this case, for the OSBI agent to have it ruled a homicide? I, I don't really know. I don't, I don't know why there was such an effort. You know, and, and I don't know if he was just fully convinced that, you know, that this husband killed his wife. Um, I, I really don't know. And, and, I, and I will say, you know, I'm, I'm not anti-law enforcement and certainly not. I mean, this, this case just really stood out to me because of everything that took place in it. I mean, it it was, especially once that pathologist, you know, said what she said at trial about, you know, just, just making a ruling based off what the police told her, even though there's no medical indicators to say it, which is complete to me is completely against what the role of the Emmy's office is. They're an independent investigative agency charged with determining cause and manner of death. But they used just the word of somebody else to make a ruling, even though there's no medical findings to support it. Uh, so that was that was the scariest part to me. But why why this happens sometimes, I don't know. I don't know if, you know, sometimes sometimes officers just get tunnel vision and they get they get fixated on on one thought and that's all they want to see happen. Uh, I don't think I, I will say it doesn't happen a lot. Um, most of most of the uh, law enforcement officers I've ever dealt with, they're they're upstanding people. They're they're honest people. They they work hard. They try to do the best they can. But at the end of the day, you know, we're also all human, and we're we're prone to to make mistakes. Yeah, for sure. And I think what's kind of fascinating to me about this case is that, well, a couple of things. One, there are so many documentaries and stuff kind of on these things now, and like the Innocence Project project and these different organizations are like, in my world, they're becoming, you know, I'm noticing more cases like this and people are talking about it more. I I think it's the University of Michigan. I think it's the University of Michigan's uh, College of Law. They maintain a registry of exonerations and and they're literally, and, and this only begins from like, I think 1986 is where their records go back to. And there are literally thousands of exonerations following wrongful convictions, and they detail why these cases were were overturned, why these people were exonerated. And, and there are quite a few of them that are literally due to, you know, police misconduct. Now, whether that was, you know, willful misconduct or they were just, you know, a bit negligent in their duties and got sloppy, uh, they don't, they don't say, but, but it does happen. It's, it, we would be lying to each other and everybody else if we said it didn't happen. I think everybody agrees that people do get wrongfully arrested, people get wrongfully accused, and people do get wrongfully convicted. Uh, and I think that's a lot more important to address than, say, you know, the the risk of a guilty person going free. Yeah, and I'm sure that there's just a whole host of, I mean, because in the case that you talked about, so I can understand, it, not that this makes it right, I'm not condoning it, but if somebody goes to trial 
I've been, I mean, I've been in the courtroom too. Everyone's wanting to win. Like it becomes, and I'm not trying to trivialize what happens in court because I think it is trivialized a little too much, but like real people's lives become part of a game. There's this incentive to win and records and, you know, so it becomes like a game. But in the case that you're talking about, this actually, this determination was made before it was even in court, before there was that incentive of a game. And so I just, I would assume that that type of behavior, it'd be a little tricky to narrow, you know, to kind of pin down what the incentive was there, unless there are stats, you know, maybe you get more points essentially on your name if it's a homicide versus accidental death, you know, or a fall. But I just, I mean, cause we just can't know every off, you know, every police officer or every agent's kind of personal thoughts about their work. And, you know, I, I don't know what this particular agent's motivation yeah. was. I just, you know, I, I would probably be more clear if I knew exactly what he discussed with the chief medical examiner sure. for that 30 minutes. Uh, sure. That would probably made it a lot more clear. But the fact that it stood as undetermined for two years, even after he had presented every single bit, of, and there was literally no new evidence presented in that two year period, zero. Wow. So, so what, what sparked them to, to change it? I don't know. Well, and I mean, I just think it's so awesome for that husband that someone like you, like that you existed to, and, and wanted to help in this case. Like I would just find that, I'm sure you find that so rewarding. And the fact that you had such diverse experience where you would know that these certain things exist. I mean, that's just, to me, I, I've had people ask me in the past, like, well, teach me everything you know. I, I can't. Like, there's just no possible way to do that. Like, I'm not going to ask you to do that, Matt. Like, tell me everything that exists at the medical examiner's office so I can do what you do. No. Like, this is why you're an expert at this. So I could just see that being really re rewarding work. It is. It, it is really rewarding. Um, just for the fact that, you know, and like I say, I want to reiterate, I'm not, I'm not anti-cop. I'm not, I'm not anti-law enforcement. I'm not pro-criminal either. I mean, that's, and that's a big misconception that, that people have about the work that we do in criminal defense. For one, they think just by the sheer name of it that we're defending criminals. It's not the case. We're on the defense side of criminal law. Just like there are, you know, criminal prosecutors, we are criminal defense. It's criminal law and we're on the defense side of it. But we're not against the police. We're actually just looking for the facts because at the end of the day, you know, we have this presumption of innocence. We are innocent until our government can prove us guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But but it seems, you know, from, from talking to people, I get the impression that most people think, most people want to say, yeah, we have this presumption of innocence. And I believe in that presumption of innocence. But to give you an example for, let's say, let's say you're sitting around with some friends and one of your friends brings up, hey, did you hear so-and-so got arrested for DUI last night? What's the first thought that comes to your mind? I mean, probably that they were drunk. No. <laughs> Shouldn't have been drinking and driving. Yeah. yeah. It hasn't been proven that they were drinking and driving. It hasn't been proved that they were impaired because here in Oklahoma, it's not illegal to drink and drive. It's only illegal to drink to the level of impairment and drive. Until we know that this police officer made the proper observations while this vehicle was in motion, that they made the proper observations while they were talking to the subject, that they administered field sobriety tests, you know, in their prescribed validated manner and gave a properly administered breath test or blood test. We don't know that this person was actually impaired. So just being charged with something doesn't mean you're guilty of it. So we're not defending criminals. We're defending citizens who have been accused of the, by their government of certain offenses. And we're making sure that before they go to prison, that their government is going to follow the law and they're going to do it the right way. Yeah, for sure. I know that it's been, uh, when I first started my practice, I remember asking someone, you know, actually, I think it was an attorney. And I said, would you find it more valuable if I had criminal prosecution experience and criminal defense experience, like both or one over the other. And, uh, you know, and we've talked about it a little bit on this podcast too, that to have both sides is really valuable because if no matter which side I'm working on, we are fact finders. We're just trying to find out what happened. And by working both sides for us, it's made us better at the other side as well to be able to be, I think, more objective, to look at what is best evidence, what's the best evidence that's been used, you know, against our client. And so, um, because we are humans 
and it is very easy to have tunnel vision or group think or whatever. And so to kind of practice, you know, staying like being a professional and staying outside of that. So. Yeah. You can, you can ask any attorney that I've ever worked with and they'll, they'll all be the first to tell you that if I look through a case and I work through it and I, and I check every angle and I can't find any possible way that this person was innocent, I'm going to be the first one to sit, sit there and look them in the face and go, you know, your person's guilty and you just need to try and work out a deal or work on mitigation or something. But there's nothing more I can do for you on this. Like I say, I'm not, I'm not trying to keep criminals on the street. And I, and I also don't, you know, whatever happens in that courtroom, it, it is what happens. I'm not the attorney. My job is just to give these attorneys the facts as I find them. Uh, I don't give them my opinions unless they ask for it. Uh, they're just getting the information that's out there. And it's their job to, to do with it what they want in a courtroom. So before we have to wrap up, I you mentioned DUI. Uh, cases, as an example, just a minute ago, you perform DUI case evaluations. So what types of clients hire you to help them in this area? I didn't even realize this existed, first of all, or even just what you said about what is illegal related to drinking and driving in Oklahoma. So I usually get contacted by attorneys. There's a, there's a handful of attorneys that generally contact me if they have a a DUI case that they, they need to have looked at. So uh, Sometimes I'll get contacted just by families, but it's, it's usually from the from their attorney. Uh, so what takes place in these is to kind of give you a, a little bit of a background. So I've got a little over 70 hours of National Highway Traffic Safety Administration training in standardized field sobriety te- testing and DUI detection. So this is the exact same training that law enforcement across the country goes through. Um, only difference is I I have more hours than many law enforcement officers. Most, unless they're, you know, unless they've been through like a ride training or they're a drug recognition expert, you'd be surprised how many police officers only have the basic training, which is what they get in their academy. I mean, I've got, you know, a good friend of mine has been on a on a police department for, gosh, probably going on 13, 14 years, and. The only time he's ever been through field sobriety test training was when he went through his academy, you know, almost a decade and a half ago. And there's been a number of different manuals come out since that time where they've updated, you know, practices, best practices on standardized field sobriety testing. So I, I try and stay up to date with all the training. And what they do is they, they when they hire me is I'll get all the videos that are out there. So the body camera videos, dash camera videos, if there's cell phone video, if it's in town and there's a building that has surveillance cameras, I'll get those videos so I can see every angle of this stop. Then I start reviewing all the videos and I want, I'm want i looking for every single phase of DUI detection. So what does the officer see from the dash camera video perspective? I'm looking at this vehicle in motion. Is it weaving? Is it swerving? Is it crossing lane lines? Is it touching the fog line? Are they braking erratically? Are they accelerating unnecessarily? Or are they driving the speed limit and staying within their lane? Then I'm looking for the command to stop. So when the officer flips his lights on, I'm looking to see, are they responding to this command to stop appropriately? Do they turn their turn signal on to indicate their intention to pull over? Then I want to look at their stopping sequence. Are they stopping off the road? Do they stop in the middle of the road? Do they go on for another two miles before stopping? Do they slam on their brakes? Is this a controlled stop or is this an erratic stop? And then the officer will get out of their car and they go up to the vehicle. So now we've got personal contact. I want to see... During this personal contact phase, how is this driver responding to divided attention questions? Because that's what officers do. They're going to say, you know, hey, you know, where are you coming from? Where are you going? Can I see your driver's license and insurance? So they're asking you to answer multiple questions while also producing documents. So they're trying to see, can you divide your attention between these tasks? And lack of divided attention is often an indicator of impairment. Looking to see if they're fumbling with their documents. Uh, so then when the officer asks them to get out of the car, how do they get out? I've seen videos where people literally climbed out of the window. I've seen them where they forgot to take their seatbelt off. I've seen them where they fall out of the car. And then I've also seen them where they just get out of the car the right way and they shut their door and they wait for further instructions. Uh, then I want to look at their balance. Are they swaying? Are they stumbling while they walk? Are they leaning against their car? What's their behavior look like? And these are things that officers should be thinking about the entire time, gauging whether this person is possibly impaired. I want to listen to their speech. Are they slurring their words? And then if the officer administers field sobriety tests, then I'm going to make sure that these tests are done and they're validated procedures. So they, these tests are designed to be done in exact way every time. That's why they are standardized. 
So it should be, if, if an officer in Anchorage, Alaska is administering this test, it should be done the exact same way that an officer down in Fort Myers, Florida is doing it. So I wanna make sure that they're following these procedures and then I prepare a report based off of all of my observations. And you know, I, I list everything that the officer does correctly and then anything that's done incorrectly or deviates from the NHTSA training manuals, then I, know, I make reference back to the specific chapter and page of those manuals where the officers were trained to do it a certain way. And so if they don't do it in this validated manner, then they've essentially created a new test that's not validated and they don't have reliable indicators of impairment to make their arrest decision. Do you end up testifying in these cases or do they typically settle after your report? So I've been called, um, I've never had a case I've worked to go to a trial. I've been uh, called to motion hearings before, but I've actually never, in, in I don't know how many of these cases I've done, I've never had to go on a stand and testify because literally every case that I've done has either been reduced, the charge has been reduced down and the client took a plea agreement or they've been dismissed. Now, and, and I said, there there are also some that I've worked where, you know, I, uh, and I won't say any names. There's a, uh, this was a few years ago. He was a sergeant in, uh, with the Moore Police Department. And it was probably one of the best DUI stops and arrests I've ever seen. I mean, I was, I was literally reading through this manual. I was looking at this manual while this, while this sergeant was doing these field sobriety tests. And he might as well have just had the manual in his hand, reading it word for word. He was, he was that good. Yeah. And so that one, I just, I told the attorney, I was like, no, you're, you're, you're broke on this one. There's nothing you can do about this. I mean, this officer was polite. He was patient. He was <laughs> professional. I mean, every possible thing that you would, you would want to see when they arrest somebody. He, he was every single bit of it. So uh, there I've had those as well. Yeah. Wow. So, so interesting. Um, well, unfortunately we are really pushing our time on this episode. So, um, but I think, you know, our, this podcast is geared towards all kinds of investigations. And so if there's anyone in who's looking to maybe expand, you know, maybe they're a private investigator and want to look more into learning about these things, or even we have law enforcement officers that listen to this as well. You have created a training based on your experience. Uh, it's called Intro to Crime Scenes and Death Investigations. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But do you want to just briefly tell us what who that's available to and what what all is included in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so it's actually two. Those are those are actually two different classes. There's one that's introduction to crime scenes, and then there's a second class that is death investigations. So they're kind of a, okay. a two part two part class. The first one, so that 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 intro to crime scenes course, that one's taught by a guy named David Ballard. He's with a he owns a company called Valor Investigations and Protections. Um, Valor's it's V A L O U R. Um, but I, I've known David for probably, you know, six, seven years. He's a you know, stand-up guy. He's a combat veteran, Purple Heart recipient. I mean, you name it, this guy's done it. And uh, so we, we partnered up and we, we came up with these courses. We developed these courses. And like the death investigation one is one I've been working on for years, like, you know, four or five years I've been developing and, and modifying this course. And it's kind of evolved over the years. But we started it back in January of 2018. The courses are accepted by CLEAT. They've been cataloged by CLEAT for continuing education. So they're good for law enforcement. They're good for private investigators, good for private security guards. The death investigation course is also awaiting accreditation from the American Board of Medical Legal Death Investigators. So it would be nationally accredited and accepted for medical legal death investigators from any Emmy or coroner office as well. But we, uh, we've got, I would say, probably six to eight courses total right now. Uh, between you know crime scenes, death investigations, um, and and David's got a number of other ones. In fact, he's got one for private investigators that is uh, investigating domestic violence that the uh, that he developed, and that was actually accepted by the district attorney's council. So, I mean, clearly we're not defense biased. We'll train anybody. We're 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 open to law enforcement and anybody else. Awesome. Those sound really interesting. If only I had time to like branch out in another area, which I don't right now, but super interesting. And I know nothing. You can ask my husband, my family. I know nothing about medical things, <laughs> like nothing. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you, Matt, for you know just taking this time today to talk to me. And if any of our listeners would like to connect with you, what's the best way to do so? Well, they can always find me um, on my LinkedIn page. They, you know, they can always connect with me on LinkedIn. They can message me through there. Uh, I'm even open to people, you know, if people just want to shoot me an email, they can always do that. 
you know, my email address, it's m.davis9720 at gmail. And they can always shoot me an email there. They can also go on Facebook, go to uh, Valor Investigations uh, Facebook page. There's search Valor Investigations and Protection. They can shoot a message to David. He can get a message to me if they're, you know, if they want to just pick my brain about a topic, I'm always open to that. If they're interested in courses that we offer, they can go to that Facebook page or my LinkedIn page and message me or David and we'll get back with them. Okay, great. Yeah, and and you do respond to LinkedIn messages because that's where I found you and that's how I connected with yeah. you. So you do get back with people. I'll make sure that we that Alicia puts the links to all of that in the show notes and the links to the training course. And so thank you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. I really enjoyed it.